Hi friends, welcome, welcome, welcome once again. So I'm going to be going through the mechanics, okay, the basic standard workings, mechanics of the consolidated financial statement. Basically, we'll concentrate more for now on the statement of financial position. We'll later look at the statement, the income statement, okay, we'll look at that one and look at disposals along the line. So for now, it is purely statement of financial position. There are some five standard basic workings, okay, um, that's what we're going to look at. Again, I want to re-emphasize that, listen, the, the workings doesn't follow any standard format. You could use any feasible, reasonable, logical format you think makes sense. Use it. There, there's no, no prescribed straight jacket format for us to use. I'm using the ACCA format to show you the standard workings. You could use any other approach. Use more books, read around, and then you rather realize that there are varied approaches that we could use in terms of showing the workings. Of course, of course, the presentation of the statement of financial position follows a standard format. That one, you cannot do anything about it, okay? You cannot easily bring equity and follow it with current assets, no. That one, you have to follow a standard format. But for the workings, please choose and pick which approach helps you. So after this particular segment, I'll try and divide this segment into two because it's quite a lengthy item. I'll, I'll make sure I keep it within 30 minutes or a little over 30 for the first section and the second section. Then I'll reintroduce you to another approach, okay? So much work for, for me, perhaps, but I don't find it as so much work once it's adding value to your life, okay? So we're going to start with the basic, the, the basic standard workings, okay? After which we will see what next we have to do. So I share my screen, and I'm sure you can see my screen. I have my interactive pen so most likely i'll be annotating on the screen to help us all understand you have the slides already you have the slides on the vle please review them you have the the prescribed text please use them now as we move on at the end of this the learning objectives is that we should be able to prepare a consolidated statement of financial position for a simple group parent and one subsidiary okay there are times where you need to prepare it for more than one parent and and for more than one subsidiary with a parent so because sometimes you see a parent company holding shares or controlling more than one subsidiary but today we're looking at one subsidiary one parent most likely that's what we test you on in the final exams okay then we're looking at pre and post acquisition profit look at this again i'll, I'll treat this again later in in, in depth okay then we'll look at non-controlling interest and consolidated goodwill accounts for other reserves we explained that okay now intra-group trading fair value adjustment we'll look at that again in a separate slide or separate video where we look at non-current asset inventory any monetary liabilities asset and liabilities not included in the subsidiary's own statement of financial position but here we also look at how to account for goodwill impairment and then we also describe the describe and apply the required accounting treatment for consolidated goodwill any questions that relate to this we should be able to answer nothing is difficult it's all about practice nothing is complicated it's all about practice it's technical that's why you need to practice more and more so that it sticks it sticks okay it's not like you wait till the very last minute and you want to juggle things up and pass that one will be difficult for you then you want to fail but if you practice alongside step by step you don't wait to the last minute come to tutorial take part in active discussions then you know you should have a foothold on the topic okay overview so what we're looking at like i said we look at pro forma uh, workings pro formas and workings that we can use okay it's not it's not cut, cut uh, cast in stone you can also use any other uh, format for the workings that you think makes a lot of sense to you okay so we look at the structure, we look at subsidiary net assets, goodwill, non-controlling assets, and fair value adjustments. We'll come back to fair value, estimation of goodwill, and proportional estimation of goodwill. Then we'll look at the group reserves. All right. Now, let's move on. So there are five standard workings, five standard workings that I've come to realize and is, is confirmed by most of the books that we use. Okay, five. So the first standard working, is for us to establish the group structure. What is the percentage holding that the parent has in the subsidiary? And again, you should be able to determine who the parent is, the acquirer. 
there are some complications sometimes, and we'll look at that again later, where the parents acquire the subsidiary in stages. Today, he's owning 20%. Tomorrow, he owns um, another 10%. The next period, he owns another 50%. So it could be in stages, okay? It could be in stages. But here, we are assuming the situation where he holds one lump sum, 50% plus, okay? Plus 50%, greater than that, okay? But remember, it could be in stages. So the question you need to ask yourself when you want to establish the parent's percentage holding or determine the acquirer is two. One, what is the parent's percentage holding in the subsidiary? Are they reporting data that you want to prepare this consolidated financial statement? And what is the date of acquisition? We always need the date of acquisition for pro rata calculations. So the date is very key. Okay, and then the percentage holding is very key. All right, to, to determine the acquirer. So we should always determine who the parent is for all business combinations so that you can prepare the, the accounts in a very easy way. There are simple marks to gain here. There are simple marks to gain over here. Because when you are presenting the heading alone, the heading for you to say that um, Tesco Group, PLC, it gives you some marks in an exams. For you to just write a consolidated, consolidated statement of financial position, okay, um, as 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 at or as of 31st December 2021, it gives you simple marks. And you'll be surprised just these two can give you about two marks out of the rest. So it's always important for you to establish the group structure and know the dates, okay. The, the, the reporting date, okay? The reporting date, I mean, not the date of acquisition. So there are just simple marks for you to know. Always the name and then the heading. The heading, the, the, the title gives you simple marks. Please take note of that and claim it. Now, after we've established the group structure, it will help us in the subsequent computations, subsequent calculations. But let me give you some few uh, theoretical backgrounds behind how to determine the acquirer. So and, uh, examples of IFRS 3. So, to identify the acquirer or the parent, okay, we have to look at this. If the fair value of one of the combining entity entities is significantly greater than the other combining entity, then the one with the greater fair value is the acquirer. Okay, in a group, one person having a very significant than value, fair value than the rest, then that one is the parent, okay, the acquirer. Again, in a com business combination, if it is effected through an exchange of voting ordinary equity instruments for cash or for other assets, then the entity who is giving up the cash or the other assets to acquire the other party is the acquirer. I'm giving cash to acquire a company. I'm giving you shares to acquire a company. So there are times you acquire a company, you don't pay cash. You issue equity shares to take over, okay? it becomes also one part of the acquisition process. Okay, note that. Or sometimes I give you um, other assets to acquire your entire company. That's also part, okay. Again, if the combination results in the management of one of the combining entities being able to dominate the selection of the management team, then the one who dominates the selection of the management team is the acquirer. Okay, so if I'm able to influence so much decision, selecting who runs a company, I become the acquirer. Okay, take note of this. All right. Determining the acquisition date. The acquisition date is always the date on which the parent, the one who has acquired a company, obtains control over the subsidiary. The date that I, so I obtain control. So if in the past I was owning 20%, I don't control you. Then in the subsequent year, additional 10%, I don't control you. It gives me 30 percent but in the five years time i acquire extra 15 or extra 20 percent or 25 giving me more than 50 percent of the shareholding that is the date on which i become the parent and i control you okay basically and then we determine the purchase price so the purchase price can be cash given it can be exchange of shares that we are given to acquire the company. It can be giving you, it can be the fact that you are you are providing some assets to acquire it, okay? So it's a combination of the fair value of all of these. 
it can be one it can be a combination of two i've seen students struggling when they say the company issued shares ordinary shares to acquire another company and they find it quite strange okay that they, they just struggle we we'll treat all of this where we pay cash easy where we use equity shares ordinary equity shares to acquire easy or where we give any other assets we'll look at this all right and you'll be fine very easy you'll be fine all right so the second working is where you identify the net assets identifiable net assets of the subsidiary okay so two um that's the standard working two okay it doesn't matter you can make it standard working one or three whichever okay so in the first instance we have three columns the acquisition at acquisition date at the reporting date and post acquisition what had what occurred okay so we always look at that of the subsidiary what is the share capital we record it okay and then the, we add any retained earnings okay at acquisition what was the retained earnings at the reporting date what is the retained earnings the difference gives us the post acquisition usually the share capital at acquisition and reporting will be the same okay then we add any other components of share okay it could be share premium share reserves okay it could also be some portion of retained earnings okay revaluation reserves so the, the difference also gives us this okay we'll look at this one we deal with the numbers then you understand if there is any so we add any retained earnings any components okay and then we we'll look at the difference in terms of post acquisition you will we'll see it usually in the question we will state clearly that at the point of acquisition the retained earnings or the other reserves were this they will clearly state it okay then we also look at fair value adjustment usually we see the fair values increasing sometimes it will decrease okay we'll look at that later we'll visit it um, in, in, in depth so any fair value adjustment the positives add it to the acquisition and then at the, at the reporting date okay and then post acquisition as well we'll look at that then you less any depreciation of the fair values which has occurred at the reporting date okay and then you also realize if there's any unrealized profit which has taken place between the parent and the subsidiary especially in the case where the parent is a seller we assume parent is selling to the subsidiary we subtract that unrealized profit if the subsidiary is a seller we'll look at that okay so basically we look at this we sum them up everything that we have outlined at acquisition date will be transferred to the goodwill calculation workings number three workings number three and then so this becomes the net identifiable fair value of the net assets which we transfer to the goodwill calculation okay and then the post acquisition elements we are going to transfer them into the nci non-controlling interest what is his share of this what is his share of this and what is our share as as the group so our group consolidated reserves will take the remaining portion whilst the nci takes its portion in terms of percentage holding okay now in terms of number four and number five i've put a note down here the difference between the reserves at the reporting date and the acquisition date that's a post acquisition is split between the group the group reserves and then the non-controlling the non-controlling the, the non-controlling elements okay this the second portion all right we'll take a simple example as we go through this and we'll better appreciate and understand this one all right then again the question is how do i recognize and measure the identifiable assets acquired and liabilities assumed okay so the cost of the combination like i said is the purchase price it's equal to the fair value of the consideration we can pay in cash we can give you shares we can give you some other assets so the the purchase price is fair it's a fair value we can always estimate sometimes you are asked to calculate it to estimate this okay where you have deferred cash payments you look use time value of money okay to look at this again the purchase price must be allocated to the assets we have acquired the liabilities we have assumed any contingent liabilities okay we will limit it to just assets and liabilities okay usually at this level okay now the assets acquired and contingent liabilities assumed will must, must be measured at fair value but like i said we will leave it at ordinary assets and liabilities contingent liabilities will treat it separately under IAS 37 okay we'll look at that standalone topic later on therefore any difference between the cost 
of the business combination and the acquirer's interest in the net fair value should be accounted for as goodwill. The goodwill is the residual. How much is the fair value of the assets that I'm acquiring? How much am I paying for it? I'm paying more than necessary than, than the, the fair value of the identifiable net assets. If I'm paying more than that, you know, accounting is quite interesting. Accounting is saying if the cost of the net assets is 10000 okay, and then you are paying 12000 accounting is saying you are paying extra, extra 2000 In the layman's mind, he will say, listen, this is a loss. It's an expense you have incurred. Accountant says, no, it's not an expense. It is something you have. It means this uh, this company you are buying has a value that you are paying for. So it is goodwill. It's an asset. And it makes life easy because the ordinary man will say this is an expense. Accounting is saying, no, it is not an expense. It's an asset. And why is it all sinking? Because they all have debit balances. Instead of me to charge it as an expense, I'll charge it as an asset. It's interesting how accounting sometimes works, okay? So that's what happens. Again, accounting says that what if the net asset is 10,000 and you end up paying, let's say, 7,000? You have gained. You see, you have gained. But for here, accounting says, yes, it's a gain. It's a gain of 3,000. It's a gain. So accounting is saying, listen, this is, this. the other man will say you've gained. Okay, accounting is saying, yes, it's a gain. But we will not normally call it a gain. We call it a bargain purchase accounting is saying you were able to bargain well to get a good price so it's a bargain purchase immediately it's again just charge it to your income statement some will charge it under um other comprehensive income as other income whichever okay so that's how accounting works if it's again it's again if, if it's a loss if it's an expense consider it as an asset okay all right so let's see what we can do next Okay, so that's it. Let's move on. Again, recognizing the, the, the measuring the identifiable assets and liabilities. So the acquirer should separately recognize the identifiable assets of the subsidiary, the liabilities, the contingent assets at the date of acquisition only if they satisfy this. Only if the assets satisfy the definition of an asset per the conceptual framework. Only if the liability satisfies the definition of a liability per the conceptual framework, okay? And only when, um, the in, in, in the case of an intangible asset, if it can be measured reliably. So even if the subsidiary per the IS38 has an in, in, internally generated uh, intangible, which was not recognized on the face of the books, here they are saying that, listen, they did not recognize it. But if we can measure it reliably, because we are acquiring, we are paying something, we can easily uh, measure it, then please identify it or recognize it in the face of your account. Recognize it in your books. Okay. So that's how interesting accounting is saying. He's saying that if the first scenario did not work, it did not recognize it, you must recognize it as an intangible. Okay. So these are the things we should note. If the asset meets the definition of an asset, recognize it. In the case of a liability, recognize it if it meets the criteria for recognition of liability. If it's an intangible asset, um, asset in contingent liability, if you can measure it reliably, recognize it. Okay. Working number three is the goodwill. The goodwill. So the goodwill simply tells us, like we said, how much did we pay? The fair, the fair value. Could it be cash paid? Okay. Sometimes you see cash consideration usually. Okay, the cash consideration. And then we add the non-controlling interest component. We have to work this before we come back. So you have to leave this hanging. Go and find the non-controlling interest. There are two approaches we could use, but we look at both sides. Okay. And then you also subtract the net identifiable assets of the subsidiary at acquisition, which we looked at at acquisition. You subtract it, and then you get a goodwill at acquisition. If there is any impairment of goodwill, Please take it out. Remember, we are not talking of amortization. Okay? We are not talking of amortization. Amortization will affect the other intangibles and the IAS 38. Okay? But goodwill is not amortized. It's not amortized. 
we look at impairment and then we get the goodwill at the reporting date, which goes into our statement of financial position. Now, the non-controlling interest, the NCR, it is at acquisition, it's measured using two. Okay, so this is where I'm talking, this was what I was talking about. So we look at the fair value of the NCI, and normally it is given clearly in the question, or you are asked to calculate to compute it. And again, we look at the NCI measured at its proportionate share of the subsidiary's asset at acquisition date. That is also good enough for us to be able to identify the NCI. So like I said, um, a bargain purchase is a negative goodwill. We don't normally say negative goodwill, okay? It's a negative goodwill. We credit it to our statement of financial, statement of profit or loss or income statement, and therefore sometimes added back to the retained earnings, okay? All right. So let's take a clear example, very simple example. H bought 100, so there's no component of NCI. 100% of the shares for this, right? The book value or the current amount of the net assets of the subsidiary at acquisition was 400. That was the book value, but the fair value was 600. So should it be 650 minus 400? No. This is a book value, okay? But the fair value on the market, if we want to benchmark it on the market, it's actually 600. What is the goodwill? Don't subtract the, the book value, the current amount. Look at the fair value. So the amount we pay, the cash consideration, 650, minus the, the fair value at acquisition gives us 50,000. There is no assumption of, a, of an NCI. So goodwill is 50,000. Very easy to compute. Assuming there's no... Um, there is no impairment. We'll leave it this way, right? Let's move on. Now, what about this question? Let's look at this. Very easy once again. H again bought 100% of the shares of S at a fair value of what? 1 million. The book value of the assets at acquisition is 900. The fair value is 1040. Okay. So on the books, on the face of the books, the assets, identifiable net assets of the company, it's 900. Should we just say we gained 100,000? No. But the fair value on the market is 1040, which means we paid more than the fair value. We paid less than the fair value, sorry. We made a gain, okay? Identify the value of the goodwill. Assume the good, okay, so identify the value of the goodwill. So the section A is that the goodwill is simply the part A. The goodwill is the 1 million minus the fair value of the identifiable net assets and we got 40 that's a, a loss more um, that is a, a, a gain to us a loss to the one who is selling so we've made a bargain purchase what we call negative goodwill at acquisition it's a gain which we will easily credit to our income statement or statement of profit and loss some will credit it under other comprehensive income look at the second part of the question assuming the goodwill was not negative okay but instead it was a positive fifty thousand. Okay, assume it was a positive 50,000. Let's say we, we, we bought it for 1 million, right? We paid 1 million. And we actually ended up realizing that the assets, identifiable assets, is 950. So goodwill is 50. Assuming it was 50,000, the useful life is considered to be 10 years. That's a tricky one. What would the amount of goodwill be after one year? It depends. It depends. We only have to undertake an impairment review, not amortization. Don't be tempted to divide the 50,000 by 10 and say that it will reduce by 5,000. No, don't do that, okay? So it depends. It depends. There is no amortization to goodwill, so the useful life is not relevant. This 10 years is not relevant. Instead, we need to do an impairment review, okay? If we do an impairment and it has not reduced, we still leave it at 50,000. If there's an impairment, we use the impairment um, element to reduce the goodwill figure okay all right let's look at the next one the non-controlling interest we need this component to help us determine the goodwill calculation now so the net controlling interest uh, non-controlling interest okay at acquisition per workings number three you remember that one gives us sometimes you'll be given clearly the the element in the question sometimes you give you clearly in the question that is the non-controlling interest component. We then add the non-controlling interest percentage of the subsidiary's post-acquisition reserves from working number two. 
don't worry. It looks like a lot is being juggled up or brought in here. When we start working the questions, you see how easy it is. After this, we'll take a question and then you'll love it. Less the NCI's percentage of the goodwill impairment, only using the fair value method, not the proportionate. Okay. And then we just get the NCI at reporting date, which goes into the statement of financial position. All right. Very easy. So, um, Assuming we did not own all the 100% of the shares, we own, the parent own 80%, then the NCI component is 20%, okay? The NCI component is 20%, all right? Let us see how we can wrap up this, okay? Two alternatives in measuring the NCI, like I said, the proportionate valid share of the, of the subsidiary's identifiable net assets and at fair value, and at fair value, okay? All right, let's take an example here. Let's take an example here. Let's take an example here. So we bought 80%. It means the NCI has 20%. At a fair value of 640, fair value of the net assets, okay, of the net assets of the, yeah, net assets of the subsidiary was 700. If H had acquired 100% of the shares, listen, the purchase price would have been 790, not 640. The fair value of the non-controlling interest, therefore, would have been what? The 790 minus 640. If we had bought, paid everything, we bought 100 percent we would have paid what? 790. Okay, therefore, the non-controlling interest component is 790 minus 640. It means the 20% holding that the non-NCI held was acquired at a cost of what? 150. Calculate the goodwill in accordance with IFRS 3. We'll look at the fair value and the proportionate. Fair value and proportionate. Let's take number one. So the first alternative, we bought, we paid 640. The fair value of the subsidiary assets was 700. We acquired 80%. So 80% of the 700 is 560. The remaining 20% goes to the NCI, right? So 80% of the 70560 subtracted from what we paid is 80,000. The first option, what we paid, okay? Where we own 80%. Or you could also calculate it in a different way. We purchased 640. Add the NCI component. NCI had 20% of the fair value of the net assets of the subsidiary. Gives us 140. Add the two, you get 780 and subtract the total fair value of the identifiable net assets of the subsidiary. That's everything, subtract everything. And then not the, not the proportionate one, everything, or the fair value. And I still get 80,000. 80, so you see that it jives. Any of the approach you use should jive. Okay, let us take the option where we bought 100%. Is there any um, NCI component? What about that one, okay? So simply you would have gone for this. And I also have gone for this to make life easy, not to think aloud. Okay, so purchase price on the basis of 100 is 790. What's the fair value of the net assets of the subsidiary? 700. I get my 90,000. Now, if you want to think aloud and look out for the NCI component which you have absorbed, what would you get? So I paid 640 again. If I had not acquired it at 100%, NCI would have been 150. You remember this, okay? Because we would have paid 790 under the 640. So his portion is this. If you add it, you get 790 once again. Subtract the entire fair value um, of the identifiable net assets of the subsidiary. And you get 90. It still jives. Okay? It still jives. Okay? Either way you use will make life easy and sensible. All right. Now, in the last workings, after which we take a break. Okay? In the last workings. So the last working, we look at the consolidated reserves, okay, the group reserves. First, 100% of the parents is recorded, okay. If there are any other components in terms after the retained earnings, other component, 100% is what we need. We then add the parents' percentage or share of the post-acquisition reserves of the subsidiary, okay, on both ends. The remaining portion goes to the NCI. Remember that. And then if there's any goodwill impairment, subtract it. If there's any gain on, on bargain purchase, if you had not credited it to the statement of 
profit and loss or other comprehensive income. Then bring it here and add it. Okay, add it to your retained earnings. Okay, and then we'll adjust or subtract any um, any unrealized profits. Assuming the parent was the seller, like I said, we'll look at intra, intra group trading later. You subtract any unrealized profits, and whatever you get is what the retained earnings that we use. Group reserves are the reporting dates. You can you add the two of them and report them. You can easily split them. Okay. We look at a different method or approach when we look at the other, the other formats of working. Now, I put an asterisk here and I said, be careful when dealing with goodwill impairment in retained earnings. Be careful. Watch it carefully. If there are uh, some dates, you need to be careful in terms of proration. You must deduct the P's percentage if the NCI was valued at fair, at, uh, it was valued at fair value. And you must deduct in full if the NCI was valued using the proportional. Okay. Proportional is equal to parent everything okay all right we'll look at an example we we'll better understand it so i'll end here i'm going to give you this question then in the next section we'll look at the question so here look at the dates on first april okay so on first april x6 we acquired 90 percent it means nci's portion is 10 percent um so pepper purchase 90 percent at a cost of 19 Okay, at the cost of 19, that's how much we paid. At this date, the balance on sources um, retained earnings was this. So that's the uh, pre-acquisition reserves at that date when we acquired it. The statement of the two companies has been given on 31st. So exactly from 1st April 2016 to that first March 2017 is one year. One year. Easy to do. No prorata. Okay, so we've been given, this is the parent, right? And this is a subsidiary, okay? So this is how much we paid. And it is clearly reflected here. The 19000 is what we paid. That was the investment. So somebody will say, what if it was more than nineteen? It was like 21000 Then you must get rid of the nineteen from this. So that later on, when you are representing, presenting your account, it will be 19 out of the 21, which gives you your extra 2000 which must be presented as investments. Okay, because sometimes the company has other investments. We need to show it. Okay, but here we're making life so easy that the investment is equal to the amount we paid. The investment we made in S. Okay, so we have our current assets, ordinary shares, retained earnings, current liabilities, and then we get our final figures balancing. The following information is given. The NCI was valued at fair value. Okay, it was valued at fair value. At the date of acquisition, it was valued at $2 million. Very easy. They've given us the value of the NCI. So in calculating our goodwill, very easy, okay? Goodwill has been impaired by 200000 since acquisition. Prepare the consolidated statement of financial position. We'll start with the workings. Working number one, number two, number three, number four, number five. Then we'll do the consolidation, okay? All right. I'll end this one here. And then in the next session... We'll come to this question again and we'll run through. Right. Makes sense. Good. Okay. So, friends, that is it. And I'll see you in the next session. Take care.